Hey, um, if you've joined us, this is our annual Thanksgiving mother daughter. Who's the mother? Who's the daughter? <laughs> um, ask and answer episode. This is kind of fun. You know, Fundraising Academy joins us week in and week out and they support us so much. But this is kind of a fun thing because um, my daughter, Camille Joy Patrick Jennings, not always been in town with us during the holidays. And so this is kind of one of those things that we get to do. Um, and so this is really a lot of fun and we are super excited, um, Kamali, that you would be here today and, and share with us, you know, um, your perspective on things. You do work in the nonprofit sector and you um, have been in, engaged in the nonprofit sector pretty much all your life, right? So mm -hmm. I would... I would say that's really an important thing. You know, before we get into any more introductions, I want to make sure that I give a shout out of gratitude to our sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that are really um, the backbone of, of going on now almost four years for the nonprofit show over 900 episodes and uh, so we extend our gratitude to these folks if you've missed any of the episodes and you want to find out more or share some of this content you can find us on our as i like to call it our sexy new app um, download the app with the qr code you can find us on streaming and podcast platforms as well um, lots going on a lot of ways to connect with us and all of the different things that we do Ask and Answer is only one part of what we do. But before we get going any further, Kamalee Joy, Patrick Jennings, hmm, that name, there's some resonance <laughs> in that name. Tell us what you do. Yep. Um, I am a marketing and project manager at GitHub. Um, GitHub is a subsidiary of Microsoft, um, and I'm on their social impact team. So um, it's a developer focused collaboration platform. I am not a developer, <laughs> but I work with our developers, our employees, um, the hundred million plus developers who are using GitHub, the platform to mm -hmm. leverage their tech for good. Um, so we don't have, you know, necessarily a traditional tech com big tech companies um, grant making process, if you will. Um, that's very common in the industry, but rather we do in-depth programming that specifically caters to developers um, and leveraging their skills for good. Do you find that you are having to educate um, your members about what it means to be a philanthropic employee? Um, because I feel like some sectors over others already have that mojo. That's part of their co corporate culture. What are you seeing within the framework of the tech world? Yeah, I mean, I would say yes and no. I think there's definitely a cohort of, if we're just talking about employees who um, do volunteering in their day-to-day -day lives, but perhaps don't even recognize that it's volunteering, yeah. meaning it could be coaching their kids' football team. It could be volunteering in the PTA. It could be um, sitting on, you know, a, their alma mater's board, but they just don't realize that that's something that um, one of our company benefits is for every one hour you volunteer, you'll receive $20 to donate to the nonprofit of your choice. So our team is always constantly working to say, hey, you're doing all these things, you're donating blood, for example, um, those count. And so we're always trying to double their impact um, through messaging. Then there's also, you know, another cohort of folks. Um, we're also international. We're an international company. So, you know, other cultures, you know, we're sitting here in the U.S. that has a very strong sense of volunteerism and, you know, financial contributions, but other countries don't have that. Um, and so we're also working, you know, to balance those different, you know, cultural aspects of what that means locally, um, you know, to, to activate employees in that sense. Wow. Is that a hard, a heavy lift? Is that hard to do? Yeah. I mean, yes and no. I think probably the, the hardest uh, using air quotes uh, lift would be that we are a remote first company. Um, we have been since before the pandemic. It's just something that is within our company culture. Um, and I think that is probably provides the most barriers, not just because of the work we do, but 
any employee communications is always just very difficult when you're in a remote environment because you always try to give, you know, several touch points, um, honing in on the same message. But with us, it's just limited because we're not seeing each other in person on a regular basis. Um, and so I would say, besides the fact that if someone, you know, has engaged in a, in a, a volunteerism project before or not, it's just how do we communicate them through, you know, the, the few uh, platforms that we have. Um, and so I think just making that personal con- connect is super important to us. And so we're always trying to drum up, you know, new ideas on how to reach employees that way. Do you, uh, I have one more question. Do you have an English first uh, situation in terms of communications? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. So everything that you're doing to engage and how many employees or employees, it's not employees necessarily, but, but members of GitHub and the cohort, how many people are you trying to, to communicate and reach out to? Yeah. I mean, so we, I mean, the work we do is really twofold. One is our employees um, directly with them in our giving programs and then externally with developers. So, you know, our goal is if there's a hundred million developers who use the platform, if we can just activate a small percentage of that to leverage their skills for good. I mean, how amazing is that? These nonprofits need help. They need technical support. And I think people think that um, nonprofits are tech illiterate and don't use technology and and GitHub is very technical, um, but they do use it and there's no reason they shouldn't. It's just, you know, how can we support them? um, Not just with product, but really with services and, you know, volunteerism, not from our, just our employees, but also from, you know, a developer anywhere in the world who can spend a few hours of their time that really would make a difference to a nonprofit. Fascinating. Well, we're thrilled um, you're here, um, and and I say let's get going because our first question is um, an interesting question. It comes from your mother in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh my goodness! <laughs> okay, your mother from Phoenix, Arizona writes in, Camly. While not new to the nonprofit sector, you are engaged with a, with board service now. What are some new skills you have learned with your nonprofit board service? Great question. So I have been on a board for just over a year now. Um, as you said, first first board. Um, and it's been super interesting. I have a communications and marketing background. And so I've really tried to, I would say first, I tried to take a step back and not just dive in, but really um, get to understand the work the nonprofit does, who's on the board, what, who are the employees, what other skills are people bringing to the table, Mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out what my skills can bring to the table. And so I would say probably after six to eight months or so, I finally said, okay, let me dive in. Now that I've kind of had a good assessment, we went through our, um, annual gala. We went through a whole cohort of programming. Um, and so I really felt comfortable to, to really voice my opinion. And so that's something that, um, I always have ideas, so it's not always easy to not say anything for, for some time. Um, and so I, I really learned to just, you know, observe. And then now I would say in the last maybe four months or so, I've really, um, been more active and really, um, being, um, I would say not upfront is maybe a, 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 an intense word, but really saying I'm the only one, you know, with the marketing and communication skills on this board. This is my suggestion. We don't have anyone specifically, you know, full-time position who is doing that work. And so I can really bring a lot of expertise and just really been, um, confident, I would say is probably a good word in, in my experience and my skills, um, to, you know, just helping the, the nonprofit, um, with everything from, you know, annual marketing to bigger campaigns to, you know, narrative building and stuff like this. So, um, I've learned that something that I might take for granted, that it's just something I've learned in my career is actually quite useful to someone else. And so I think that's been really special, um, to, to kind of discover that, I guess, in the last few months. Do you feel, this is a follow-up question, do you feel that your age um, and not only your chronological age, but you being a new board member, so those two things, is that 
working against you and the way that the organization responds to your information and your expertise? Or do you have any sense of that? You know, um, I would say no, which is refreshing because I think, yeah. I, I don't know if that's unique. I think it might be, I've been in a position where I've been like early in my career, an intern and then a full-time employee. And there's always a big learning curve for other employees <laughs> on how to treat you differently, similar to, to this scenario. Um, but I would say, I, I also will put the caveat that when I joined, a large number of board members joined, so I wasn't the only wow. person joining. So perhaps that's part of it. Um, but no, there, there hasn't been any um, second guessing of my opinion based on my age, which I think think I'm the youngest person. Um, and then also my actual participation on the board. Um, so no, which I've been very fortunate about, I guess. You are fortunate because my first uh, major board I was on, and I had been on other boards, but this was a very significant board. I was the youngest person and I was a female, very few females. And mm -hmm. for the first two or three meetings, the other old I'll say it, white men board me, <laughs> members would ask who I drove. Mm, yeah. And I'd be like, at first, like the first time I didn't get it. I was like, well, I drove myself because I didn't <laughs> get And then I realized, well, they thought I was like somebody's secretary or caregiver mm -hmm. bringing them to the board meeting. Yeah, we, you know, this Very board nice. where it's all female. Um, so I don't have that. I think that it's... Um, I think everyone's just there to learn. I think a lot of the other women on the board are, this is also their first board seat as well. And so I think it's a lot of us kind of in the same boat, um, which just creates a um, more welcoming environment, which is um, great, I think, for my first experience, um, you know, but also I, I, I mean, to your story, I, I caution that this is probably not super realistic for my for my next endeavor <laughs> at yeah, some point you know this is you know Jarrett Ransom the nonprofit nerd always says if you've seen one board you've seen one board you know that they're they're all yeah. 1.8 million nonprofits in this country governance is a huge thing and it should be consistent but it's not and so mm -hmm. things are different and so mm -hmm. okay well let's go to our next question and um interestingly enough this question do you want to do you want to read it because it comes yes julia you have worked with a lot of nonprofit boards what is the next type of nonprofit you want to serve interesting great question, Good question your <laughs> daughter from menlo park um you know i think what i want to do is focus on um a national board mm. Or, or a board doing um, NGO work, you know, meaning they're working outside of our country. Um, mm -hmm. Because I've, I've moved to a point in my knowledge bank where I can be more strategic. Um, I don't have to be so community focused, which is I've been my whole life. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, with you, you've been community focused in many, many ways. Um, but I think it, I think this is my I think that's my next thing. And, and uh, I have a, a different perspective. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of interesting. Okay, let's go to the next question um, that came in from Linda from Dayton, Ohio. Oh, I bet it's cold there today. I'm just saying. Yes. <laughs> Camille, as a millennial, people born between 1981 and 1996 and who are now ages 27 to 42, how many of your cohort friends serve on nonprofit boards? This is a good question. Do these mm -hmm. friends and acquaintances even want to serve on nonprofit boards? I'm trying to rec yeah, I'm trying to think. You know, I would say that I come, I'm a part of a, yes, I'm a millennial, but I would say I'm also living in a bubble where my LinkedIn connections, my Instagram friends, you know, my, my cohort of people are people who I've met through types of service like this. So I don't, I would say that the, the answer is yes. Like I do have friends who serve on their community boards, be it a small nonprofit or maybe something a bit bigger um, as they kind of work their way up in their career. But I would flag that, you know, I, 
it's because I'm a part of that cohort, if that makes sense. You know, I mean, it's, um, it's, I think, fantastic. I know people who sit on the boards of their, you know, city ballet or their local, you know, chamber of commerce or, you know, their, their alma maters. I mean, there's a lot of different um, positions, which is awesome to see. And that's really across the, mostly U.S. based a- across the country. But um, again, I'll just flag that um, if you were to, I don't know, maybe look at someone's link, look at my LinkedIn versus looking at, you know, someone I went to high school with who's now uh, in finance or something had a very different path, right. they probably wouldn't see the same content that I'm looking at of, you know, people involved. Um, not to negate that, but I just think it's, yeah. I'm in this like weird bubble um, mm-hmm. of people who are like-minded in that sense. <laughs> So within your career tra- trajectory, I mean, having gone to the school in the East and then serving, working for uh, Charity Water, serving in the White House, working in a UN agency, would you find, do you think that those people that you worked with just because of not only their their work, but maybe their empathy or the things that they were around has driven them that way as well? Or is it just opportunity? Like you you meet yeah. people and they, they're like, oh, come join us. You you know the, the score. Right. Um, you know, I think it's a bit of both. I think probably first it's the passion that we share in this type of person, you know, whether it was our upbringing, whether we had a, um, I, I'm, I know you talk about this, uh, um, I'm going to say it's an aha moment, but it's your, your moment that really says, opens your eyes to say, oh, this is my call to serve or the passion that I want to follow. Um, I think that's probably a bigger driver than, oh, hey, this spot's open. Do you want to come join the board? You know, I think with the people I know, that's probably leaning more towards that. Um, But needless to say, of course, I mean, a lot of it is networking and, and, you know, just finding that passion left or right. Um, but I will also say something that I, I have um, a, a fantastic mentee and I she's um, studied the same thing I did in university and she's looking, she's graduating soon and she's trying to figure out what she wants to do. And she she wants to lead a, a career that is impact driven, but it's it's difficult. You know, you oftentimes have to take a pay cut or less benefits or move somewhere you don't want to. And so she's she's toying with what do I do? And so I said, you can if you find that great, but you can also find that passion project outside of work. And so I think that finding that balance is, yeah. you know, some of the people in my cohort back to that question is some of them um might have that in their job. I am lucky to have that in my job um, is what I've chosen to do, but doesn't mean you can't do that outside of work and kind of fill that gap if you're, if you're missing that. So I think some people have, have finding, are finding both. And I've also seen as I'm getting older, you know, people are a little more established in your career and and they're looking for that outside of their career. Um, So I think that the passion and then having that little kind of void, if you will, is, is driving people to, to be more active. I love that. And and I think that's, I think that's incredibly wise. Um, it, it kind of dovetails to this next question and it comes to us from Houston and, and it's actual, and this happens every once in a while, an actual board or group will send in a question. And the question is this, when it comes to getting younger board members, which we've been chatting about to participate in a give or get process, how can we make this commitment more achievable? We want to cultivate younger board members, but our $5,000 give or get is prohibitive. I think that's a high give or get, (laughs) especially if you're looking for someone who's um, a younger millennial. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also now it's really tough with, I mean, macroeconomic climate we're in and companies are really not giving benefits Mm -hmm. like this anymore. Um, I think they're probably, um, they have employee benefits, meaning something like we have, you know, where it's like, oh, you can volunteer and get $20 or or we'll match your contribution, which is great. But those are the types of things that start to go when budgets are being cut and workforces are being reduced. And so I think, you know, in a more traditional corporate America where they would say, okay, here's the budget for, or here's the product you can give or the services you can give, you know, via your job to a nonprofit. 
I really don't know too many companies that are doing that right now, at least in my group of friends, um, you know, who are have all, all different types of jobs, not just talking about tech. Um, so I would say that it seems to be a higher number. And I would say it doesn't have to necessarily come from the company they work for, but you could focus on, um, you know, ticket sales for a fundraiser or just donations from family and friends, but it's tough. I mean, that gets repetitive year after year. If your commitment's three years and you're asking the same people to, you know, participate, you know, in this nonprofit you support, you know, it's, it's not easy and, and no, no one likes to ask for money. That's scary, <laughs> you know? So, well, it's tough. You know, it, it is hard. And as you know, I do a lot of public speak and um, years ago I came up with a, a solution that worked for me at a young age. And that was to develop, if, if you will, a scholarshiping. And mm. I think you can do that for a lot of different things. Now, I'm not saying you can, you can scholarship, you know, 70% of your board, but you could scholarship in, you know, one, two, three, and you need to make it very clear. Like, wow, this is to the board and be very transparent. This is mm -hmm. why we're doing this. Um, and, and I think it's brilliant. I think it's an easy yeah. way to, to get new blood in and, and then cultivate something different. I love that idea. I think, I think, and also, you know, it just increases their board diversity, which is so important, you know, from skills to age to demographics, it's so important to have a different perspective. So, um, but yeah, I would say a lot of people who I know who are interested in looking to, for board service have never heard of a scholarship option. And that is the give or get is something that is is prohibitive because they're like oh gosh that's a lot of money you know um and because I'm already giving my time and you know so it's it's kind of a um it's tricky but I, I love that idea well thank yeah I mean I think it's just one of those things that we need to be thinking about what it is we need for our boards how we're going to navigate that that talent mix and then figure out how we bring that talent in also, the other thing is, you know, 1.8 million nonprofits in the U.S., there's a lot of competition yeah. for getting good talent, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be thoughtful about this. And, and the $5,000 is, or 10000 or 100000 whatever it might be, is not the money that should be running the organization. Yes. Right? So, right. so I mean, I <laughs> yes. think you can be a little bit more creative and, um, yes. you know, look at that. Well, it's hard to believe that another year of the mother-daughter episode on the nonprofit show has come to a close. It's been very exciting to see Kamalee Joy Patrick Jennings. You might recognize one of those last names. <laughs> I'm just saying. Marketing and Project Manager, Social Impact at GitHub, github.com. Fascinating work that you do. It touches all of our lives and so many people don't know about they might have seen your logo somewhere um, out and about but this is really interesting work that you're doing and thank you so much thank you thank you for having me happy thanksgiving <laughs> happy thanksgiving to you um i just am so so excited to be able to have these conversations um with you you bring a really rich and robust um, perspective to how the nonprofit sector works on so many different levels. And it's truly an honor to be your mother. I am very thankful in the spirit of Thanksgiving. So I say thank <laughs> you. Um, and so you might have to wait a whole year to have Kamalee Joy Patrick Jennings back on the nonprofit show. But um, check out thanks the day after thanksgiving because it's always kind of fun again we have amazing sponsors and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy your part-time controller nonprofit thought leader fundraising academy at national university staffing boutique nonprofit nerd and nonprofit tech talk these are the folks that help us get this content out again camely more than 900 shows we're marching towards 1000 which will happen um at, in early 2024 Wow. Oh my gosh. Big celebration. Can't wait for that. <laughs> I know we, we do. Jarrett Ransom was like, look, we can't just say, oh yeah, today's our 900th show. Like we did um, this. We need to like have something. Yeah. A whole week dedicated to the big day. I mean, that's huge. That's yeah. wild.
Yeah, it is kind of crazy, but it's, it's an amazing thing. Well, hey, you know what, um, Kamali, again, I'm just delighted that you could join us and be a part of a really interesting perspective um, from so many, so many ways and routes that you come to a life of service and working um, in a much in a very profound way from, you know, being a little girl and working on so many different uh, organizations and projects um, that you found your own, didn't always come from your dad and I, I mean, things that you would, you know, show up when you learned to drive, you were driving down downtown Phoenix to serve food at Andre house by yourself. So, I mean, it's pretty cool to see this trajectory and we're incredibly proud of you. So thank you very much. The apple does not fall far from the tree, as I think I say every year. So <laughs> thank you. I don't know. I think I try and kick it away from the tree every well, once in a while. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, hey, everybody, we end every episode with our mantra, and it means different things every single day, honestly. Um, and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here on Monday. Kamali Jennings. Enjoy your weekend, my love. Thank you. Bye. Bye.